Good morning, church. There it is. Yes. It's good. <laughs> yeah, now we went over the top, right? So it's so good to see you and welcome you all here. We are Wellspring. We are the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, all are loved, and all means all. And we're so glad to have you here with us. For those who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you to this sacred space as well. And we're so glad that you're here with us. And uh, we, want, we encourage you to click the See More button in the Facebook description. If you're watching with us on Facebook uh, Live, and you, there you have a link and a way to register your attendance, to make your gifts, to see the e-news, which is where all the announcements uh, that we highlight here are found, all the details. And so we, we really encourage you to, uh, to take a look at all of that. And please know that we are so glad that you're with us here. For everybody in the room, register your attendance on the, regi on the blue registration cards that you had. Put those in the uh, offering plate. Also, if you use Shelby Next, you can register your attendance and make your gift there if you wish. Um, the, um, in, the, in our e-news, and you can, again, same thing here, e-news. E news, e news. We say that every single week, right? Y'all know that word. And uh, so there in, the, in this week's e news, you'll see announcements about uh, Methodist Federation for Social Action and their presentation this afternoon with John Elford at 3 p.m. in this space. It's really good. John, author, uh, is coming to talk about his book uh, that is titled Our Hearts Were Strangely Lukewarm. Is that right? Yeah. And so, uh, an interesting, and it's, a, it's about Methodism and our, our uh, history with race, and so it's important. Uh, mission opportunities that we have there include caring place donations, um, UMCOR, uh, United Methodist Committee on Relief, helping with multiple uh, devastating events around the globe. You can see that there. Congregational care ministries within our church. And uh, you can also see a celebration of our church's green step to have our electricity move to uh, all renewable resources for, for the church. And uh, then Sunday school classes, uh, BLT book studies, uh, all these things, prayer requests, and more. So uh, it's all there in the e-news, and we encourage you to really look there. So, um, friends, we come to offer ourselves in worship. We come to talk about how God reconciles and redeems and works with us and lives in and through us and brings us to new places in our relationships with God and with one another. And we do that by worship. So let's stand as we join together in worship. Let us call ourselves to worship. Let us walk in humility and community, for we do not live to ourselves. You have a part. <laughs> yes. 
we live by ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. And so, when we For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that Christ might be Lord of both the dead and the living. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall be praised to God. Then let us be accountable, and let us praise God. occasion have families that are joining us on online so uh, but also this is a this is something that's going to set up Jessica's sermon so this is a this is a book that we're going to share together it is uh, by Archbishop Desmond Tutu the late Archbishop Tutu and Douglas Carlton Abrams and it is uh, this incredible book called God's dream and so I want you to um, I want you to hear this book as we, you'll get to see the images on the screen. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires or about being treated like a full person no matter how young you are or might be? Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I'm sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. 
God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters. Yes, even you and me. Even if we have different mommies and daddies or live in different faraway lands. Even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God. Even if we have different eyes or different skin. Even if you are taller and I am smaller. Even if your nose is little and mine is large, dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It is really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, laughing, as easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. Love this one. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. God teaches us about community. God's dream for us is something that is so much bigger than what I want or my own world. It is about bigger, it's, it's bigger than even just a single church. It's bigger than almost anything because it is about creating the community that is the global community where God abides. And we do it this way. Let's pray. And I'll ask you to repeat after me. Dear God, God. thank you for teaching us us. how to be community together. together. Thank Thank you for sharing your dream And may your dream come true through us. Amen.
I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading is a scripture translation adapted by Will de Gaffney in a woman's dictionary for the whole, excuse me, woman's lectionary for the whole church. And this is Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Listen for the word of God. Peter came and said to Jesus, Rabbi, if a sibling sins against me, how often should I forgive? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the realm of, God, of heaven may be compared to a human ruler who wishes to settle matters with their enslaved debtors. When the settlement began, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought forward. Since that one could not pay, the ruler ordered that enslaved person to be sold, together with spouse and children in every possession, and thus to pay. So falling and kneeling before the ruler, the enslaved debtor said, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of compassion, the Lord of that enslaved person released that one and forgave the debt. But the same enslaved person who was owed a hundred denarii by another enslaved person, upon going out, came upon the debtor and seizing that one by the throat said, pay what you owe. And then the indebted slave fell down and pled, have patience with me and I will pay you. But the other enslaved person was not willing and went and threw the debtor into prison until the debt was paid. When those who were also enslaved saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned the one whose debt was forgiven, saying to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the Lord handed that one over to be tortured until the entire debt could be paid. So my heavenly Abba, will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your sibling from your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated.
I know, it's this mic and this mic. We good? Okay. So I invite you to imagine that you're in my house. Now, you don't need to know what it looks like. You just need to know that it's an ordinary weekday around 5 p.m. It's been a long day at school for our third grader and our kindergartner. Um, David and I have each been through the ups and downs of a full work day. Everybody's hungry. Um, one parent is trying to cook dinner while the other is trying to get the girls to clean up the explosion that always occurs out of their backpacks when they come in from school. I don't even know how that happens, but it does every day. Um, and one kid notices that the meal being prepared is not their preference and starts to express that. Um, and then the other child ignores the request to clean up and instead goes and makes another mess in a different part of the house. Um, the parent who's cooking starts to get frustrated with the child who's now whining about the meal, not just saying that's not what they want. They're whining, full on whining. Um, and ask that child to go find something else to do, maybe a little too harshly. So then that child begins to cry. And meanwhile, the parent um, who's trying to get the other kid to clean up, trying to get that one, um, trying to hold that child accountable for being responsible for their things, um, that child screams at the parent, runs into their room, slams the door. Um, the parent in the kitchen can hear the noise down the hallway and asks the parent down there what's going on. Of course, that parent receives the question as a criticism, which is not how it was intended. Do I need to keep going? <laughs> Do I need to keep going? Okay. Um, so we have one child sulking in their room, another one crying, adults miscommunicating, the house is still a mess, everybody's frustrated, there's food on the stove, and we're about to sit down to a family meal. Um, does this sound familiar? Like, even if you haven't had this exact circumstance or this particular situation, I bet we've all experienced interpersonal conflict, maybe at a time when everybody's at their worst. Um, certainly this is not, <laughs> this is not the situation in our house on a daily basis, but sometimes, sometimes it is. And when a series of events like this occurs, everything escalates beyond what anyone intended, right? Um, and we all end up needing to ask for forgiveness from one another. Will you pray with me? God of mercy and grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts gathered here be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Thank you for being our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Anne read our gospel for today, the story that is often titled the parable of the unmerciful or the unforgiving servant. And we read um, Wilda Gaffney's translation of this text. She's a womanist biblical scholar and she translates the text from the perspective of a black woman. And so um, I, I appreciated her translation in a lot of ways. Um, it helped me to receive this text in a new way. And a couple of things I just want to point out, um, rather than using the term servant or slave to describe the people who were indebted, she translates it as enslaved person because enslavement is a state of captivity and not a person's identity. Additionally, um, she chose to make the genders of the characters indeterminate to offer a different reading. Um, and her translation certainly enabled me to hear this text differently, and I hope it did the same for you. As we begin, I invite you to consider what we heard last week, um, the parable of the lost sheep. Andy talked about that in the Kids Minute, followed by um, the text about addressing sin within the church. And as he unpacked that text, Jeff shared about our calling to live the way of love through restorative justice. And as a reminder, he said that restorative justice is about restoring wholeness to the offender and the offended, to the oppressor and the oppressed, to the victor and the victim. It's about breaking down hierarchies and restoring everyone to the same level playing field. So keep that context in mind as we consider today's text. The parable we read today concludes this section of Matthew's gospel that's focused on relationships in the Christian community in which Jesus says the same thing repeatedly. He says that the love of the Christian community for one another is very important, that um, the family of God is called to strengthen their community with one another. That's a primary part of our calling. And this final story is a cautionary tale, to say the least. It begins with Peter asking Jesus how often he should forgive. And he suggests seven times, thinking maybe that's generous. Um, 
And Jesus answers not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. Or some translations say 70 times seven, which if you know your multiplication tables, is 490. That's a lot of times. That's a lot of forgiveness. And then like any good preacher or teacher, Jesus backs up his answer with a story. And the story goes like this. An enslaved person who owes the ruler an impossibly large sum is brought before the ruler who orders the indebted one to be sold along with their spouse, their children, their possessions, all in exchange for their debt. But the enslaved person pleads with the ruler saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And that one's debt was forgiven. There's no more calculating, the ledger is wiped clean, the books are balanced without a cent being paid. The person is not sold, their family and their possessions remain intact, their life is returned to them. But the same person whose debt has been entirely forgiven does not offer the same to the one who is indebted to them. In fact, the same line, have patience with me and I will pay you, doesn't even work with the one who successfully employed it as an appeal before their own enormous debt was forgiven. Instead, the one indebted to them is thrown in jail until the debt was paid, which, by the way, makes that enslaved person's loved ones even more vulnerable. So it's not just a punishment for them, it's a punishment for their family as well. And the one who has been forgiven, who's experienced restorative justice, is here employing retributive justice against another. And when the ruler angrily summoned the one whose debts had been forgiven, the ruler retracted the debt forgiveness and handed that one over to be tortured until the entire and possibly large debt can be paid. They were offered mercy and forgiveness, but did not offer the same to another. And the last line, verse 35 says, so my heavenly Abba will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your sibling from your heart. So let's pause here. Is anyone else feeling anxious or queasy right now? Anyone? Um, (laughs) Didn't this story begin by saying this is what the realm of heaven can be compared to? So does this story mean that God will hand us over to be tortured if we don't forgive as we've been forgiven? That's one way. That's one way that this parable has been read. That this is about forgiving others to save ourselves. That it's about offering mercy so that God will be merciful to, others, to us. Otherwise, we'll receive what we're due. But that's a very dualistic reading of this parable. And so I invite us to take a step step back and ask, is that reading consistent with the character of God, with our experience of God? Does this sound like the realm of heaven? Or if, if that language is not familiar to you, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, does this sound like the realm of heaven as you've come to understand it by reading scripture? I think it's possible we might agree that the answer to those questions is no, And so we can't stop with a surface level reading of this text. We must dig deeper as we try to discern the meaning of this parable. So let's consider another text from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. It says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Where have you heard that before? (laughs) I'm actually looking for you to answer. (laughs) Where have you heard that before? Lord's Prayer, yeah. So in the Lord's Prayer, when we pray it, we ask for God's forgiveness for our debts or our trespasses. We use that um, more commonly. And the line that follows is, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The two cannot be separated. Jesus makes that clear in this prayer. And so keep that in mind as we consider a non-dualistic reading of this text. The final verse of the parable, verse 34, says, In anger, the ruler handed that one over to be tortured until the entire debt could be paid. The Greek is perididomai atos ho basanistis. And while I don't profess to be particularly proficient in Greek, and there are probably some people in this room who are a lot more proficient in Greek than I am, any ordinary person can see when they look at a Greek-English interlinear Bible that there are a lot more English words in there than there are Greek words, uh, presumably to try to make sense of it in our Western context. And the Greek words I want us to pay attention to are parodidomai, which can be translated many ways. It's used in all these ways in the New Testament. can be translated to give over, hand over, entrust, commit, yield up, abandon. And the other Greek word is basanistas, which can be translated as a tormentor, an inquisitor, a keeper of a prison. 
And so um, we don't have time for me to lay out all the English translations I read for you and the very broad differences in the way that this sentence is translated in English, but I'll say the broad variance in translation leaves a lot of room for interpretation. It seems to me that this sentence could be just as easily understood to be passive as it could be aggressive on the part of the ruler. If you read it passively, the ruler handed over the indebted one to a tormentor. And we could understand that to mean that the enslaved person was left to a prison of their own making, a prison in which they were tormented by their unforgiveness of another. The, the ruler threw away the calculator, but the enslaved person kept calculating, effectively putting themselves in solitary confinement, torturing themselves by holding on tightly to what they believed they were owed. So to me, this parable is not about what God will do to us for our unforgiveness, but about what we will do to ourselves when we refuse to forgive. Because God has given us the gift of free will. God has given us the ability to choose, and we choose what to do. This story tells us that we can choose forgiveness, and our life will be returned to us, or we can be eaten up on the inside, effectively putting ourselves in prison. The enslaved one was not sent by their ruler to be tortured, and said they were tortured by their own choices. Returning to God and the nature of God, God is merciful to us, and God is continuously offering us forgiveness, the gift of reconciliation that's made possible through Jesus Christ, no matter the amount of debt that we've accrued. It's beyond calculation that God will forgive us as soon as we ask, and to live authentically as forgiven and reconciled people, we're called to live a life of forgiveness. Loving as Christ taught us to love, not just seven times, not just 77 times, but beyond all calculation. And there's something else I want to be clear about here, that forgiveness is not permissiveness. This parable illustrates that an ongoing action that does harm to others is something that needs to be addressed. Did the ruler forgive the debt and then ignore the forgiven one's act of forgiveness of another? No. The ruler was angry about it. The ruler called that one back to address the harm done. The ruler drew a boundary and held that one accountable. But the ruler also did not follow through on their original intention, which was to sell that one along with their family and their possessions to pay the debt. The indebted one said, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And that was what initially changed the ruler's mind, the plea that led to that one not being sold and instead forgiven. And while that one is in a prison of their own making, in their own solitary confinement, the text does not tell us anything about this, but I suspect the ruler is not continuing to lend that one money. Uh, forgiveness does not make the offensive action okay, nor does it give permission for that person to continue hurting others. And so that brings us to the book that Jeff shared with us today. I hope you were paying attention. Um, that book is written by Desmond Tutu and Douglas Carlton Abram. And I want to highlight a few pages in the story. I think that y'all are going to see them. Okay. Um, they say, Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. If you hear nothing else I've said today, I hope you take in this reminder that Christ is within each of us. That when we love one another, we're loving Christ. When we forgive one another, we're reconciling with God. This book, as I said, was co-written by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a man who spent his life working to bring about equality and peace and justice in post-apartheid South Africa, he was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which focused on restorative justice in his deeply divided country. And this man who spent his life working to bring about restorative justice in the midst of these deeply systemic issues reminds us that it begins with us. Through this book, he leads us to consider our role in bringing about 
God's dream of peace and forgiveness for our world. Forgiveness is something that we practice every day. We need it again and again, and we offer it again and again. That's why I call it something that we practice, because it's something that I, I'm not going to ever perfect, um, and I'm not sure that any of us will ever perfect, but we practice it over and over and over and over a lot more than seven times, more than 77 times even. So returning to the story about my family in the beginning, I'm probably going to need to ask their forgiveness for sharing that story. Um, they'll recognize it because it actually happened in my house this last week. Um, as parents, we make a point to be intentional about apologizing to our children for asking for their forgiveness uh, when we need it. We're also intentional about apologizing to each other in our children's presence when the occasion arises for that as well. And the situation last week led me to remember and bring back a practice we used to have as a family called sads, glads, and sorries. And um, the practice of sharing our sads, glads, and sorries during dinner helps us to remember and name something that happened to us that day that was sad, something that made us glad, and something that we're sorry for. It enables us to reflect and to ask forgiveness for the things that happened in our day that we may need to seek re reconciliation for within our family or to name someone outside our family that we need to apologize to or ask forgiveness from. And this practice reminds us that forgiveness is something that we practice over and over and over. And sometimes we have big things that we need forgiveness for, or someone else is asking us to forgive something that's big. But more often it's those daily things, the raised voice, the harsh tone, the slam door, the disregard for someone else's effort, no matter how big or small the debt, we're called to forgive because we've been forgiven. We forgive in response to the forgiveness that we receive through Christ, who makes possible our reconciliation with God. A forgiveness that is beyond all calculation. And as followers of Christ, we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. To say those words and to practice them is to help God's dream come true. And God smiles like a rainbow when we do. Amen. you to join me in this prayer of confession that we share together. It's in your bulletins. It's on the screens. Join me. Loving God, we confess that we struggle to forgive and we struggle to create space for forgiveness to happen. We rush ourselves to excuse the harmful speech and actions of others as a way of suppressing 
instead of honestly naming the hurt we have experienced. We expect others to pardon our faults without also attending to our own need to repent. We demand forgiveness from others instead of recognizing forgiveness as a gift we give to one another and that we receive from you. We wield forgiveness as a weapon instead of a bridge that brings us back together. Forgive us, we pray, and free us to joyfully extend mercy and grace to one another, to set and respect boundaries with one another, and to receive from you the love and wisdom we need to grow as a community of Christ. Amen. As our ushers come forward, we think about what we have received. We think about where we need to forgive and how we need to forgive and where we need to ask for forgiveness. And so in that spirit, let us pray. Gracious God, we forget. We forget all that you have given to us the gift of life itself, the things that we enjoy and that we claim as ours, many times at the expense of someone else, and sometimes an entire body of people. And so, oh God, we help us to learn to give and recognize that you have given to us so that we may give just as you have forgiven us that we might forgive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
So how about it, church? There's always this challenge that is, is here, and today this is the challenge that is a big one for us. It's to live according to how God dreams. What is God's dream for you? What is God's dream for your community? How will God use you to restore and shape this realm of God that we experience in this world? Consider that as we sing. forth as forgiven and reconciled people to share the love of God and the mercy of Christ in the world. You don't go alone. You go with the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit walking with you every step of the way. Go in peace. Amen.